Okay, we're back. We're live. It's Think Tech Remote. That's because everything we're doing these days is remote. And this morning here on a given Monday, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm going to be talking to John Fink. John, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Jay, happy to be here. Good to be back on. Yeah, absolutely. We want to see more of your smiling face. This is Community Matters, and we're talking about your book. Your book, and I'm looking at it now. I'm going to show it. Think about it. Ideas and Inspiration for Today's Hawaii by John Fink. There it is. Just came out, copyright, but um, let's see. Oops, I got to get it right. Okay. Um, nice picture, John. Um, thank you. It took a lot of takes, but thank you. <laughs> you know, the thing is, when, you know, when, I, when I first started college, I studied speech. Not that it's done me much good because I, people identify me as New York all the time. But um, they can't identify you as, as New York or any place in particular. You have, my, my, my limited speech training teaches me that you have an all-American dialect. You have a perfect voice for, for audio, video, media. You know, isn't that, you ever noticed that? Do you work on that? Well, I don't know if it's perfect, but it's gotten me where I've gotten so far. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's funny, Jay, when I, when I, uh, I grew up my first uh, nine years was on the East Coast. And when I got to Chicago, uh, I did have a bit of an Eastern accent. And a lot of the people there, now this is quite a long time ago, they thought I was from England. So there was one gal that I fooled for three years by putting on a pseudo English accent because that's what they thought East Coast was, was England. So. <laughs> It's not limited to Chicago, by the way. <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah, anyway, so you've had you've had a wonderful career in media in Hawaii. You are, in my view, you're Mr. Media. You've been in uh, one, two or three uh, uh, TV channels and managed them. Um, and probably the one that comes to mind at first is K Five. You 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 made it what it is today. But are you retired now, or are you or are you partially retired? What's your deal right now? I'm partially retired, as you know. I mean, I've got the book, but obviously I've, I've been doing, uh, for about six months now, I've got a weekly uh, column on this inside front cover of Midweek, which I enjoy doing. Uh, and I was going to be doing some seminars, but obviously we're not doing seminars these days. So that'll be on hold for at least another three to six months. Who knows how long? Uh, Do you know I'm something I don't know? At, no, <laughs> no, just stay safe, Jay. Um, but um, I'm still I'm still on about ten or eleven uh, community boards. Uh, I'm very active with uh, the Stadium Authority and uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters and St. Francis and the Hawaii Bowl and uh, oh boy, Hawaii Council on Economic Education and the Aloha Festivals. I've got about ten or eleven boards, so that's keeping me busy remotely these days. But keeping me busy, but uh, I'm still I'm still looking to do more. I still want to help out in the community and get involved and uh, and maybe uh, one last great gig to try to make a difference and help out. Uh, God knows we're going to need it over the next couple of years. So anyway, yeah, um, I'm, to, still, I'm still yeah. out there. We have to reinvent ourselves. But I want to talk to you about your book because it's, it's more than a book. It's a, it's a sort of worldview or a Hawaii worldview. Um, and it wasn't even your idea, was it? Doing these, uh, doing these, uh, uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, uh, Hyde Park editor, Hyde Park type statements. When the, <clears throat> the mood struck you and you did all together, at least the book tells us that you did like 2,000 of them in a, what, a 20 year period. And this is a collection of maybe 200 of them. Um, and it's very interesting. And I want to talk to you about how that started. It wasn't your idea. They came to you, right? The, 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 well, you know, the people that are running the media. Group. Yeah, we had an ownership group that required that all of the TV stations, not necessarily the general manager, but in most cases, it was mostly the general manager, uh, come on twice a week and uh, in the news or at the end of the news, uh, give a, uh, an editorial, a, a vignette, uh, something that might be either uh, difference making or community concerns or things of interest in the community. And my thought was I had a really sharp program director, uh, a guy named Dan Schmidt, and we were trying to come up with a name with it. And I said, look, it, it's our station. It's, it's my viewpoint. I'm going to write every one of these, which I did. And I'm proud that I never missed one in 19 years. Um, but he came up with the idea of think about it. And he came, these were going to be philosophical 
uh, soliloquies or mandates or what ifs or at least topics that people could think about. And I decided rather than try to artificially take on world subjects of which I had little knowledge or could have little influence or even people locally could do little about, I tried to as often as possible, Jay, try to pick on subjects that were very germane and specific to Hawaii and very timely and topical. And the, the, the concept was think about it, but in parentheses it was, and now do something about it if you can. So that was kind of the philosophy. And um, what's interesting is they've never been compiled altogether because obviously they ran for 75 to 90 seconds twice a week for 19 years on KHNL and K5. And they were never meant to be back to back to back to back. So I, I guess what I'm saying is the book might be best as a, as a bedside uh, table book where you read about four or five of them and then you go to sleep or, or whatever else, because they're all, they're done in the book chronologically. We chose, I want to say it's 187 or 188 of them out of the 1975 that we cut. Um, and they were all meant to be video, so they weren't even meant to be just the written words. So sometimes there are facial expressions and things that I knew I would do in these, or I would show footage in the background. And of course, uh, some translate better to the written word and some don't. So that was the premise for it. I wrote every single one of them. So uh, if you like them, thank you. If you don't like them, thank you. Um, I, I can't blame anybody else. I, 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 I quote people and quote statistics a lot in my editorials, but um, I, I felt it was it was my station, and I felt that I wasn't going to pretend it was something else or it was somebody else's words. And while I certainly got ideas from other people and from outside sources all the time, um, one of the things that I found in the book, Jay, and I went through it to try to find the ones that I thought would either be the most relevant or stuff that hadn't changed in 20 years that's incredibly frustrating i found there were certain topics that came up over and over again because as we all know there are a lot of issues in hawaii which simply don't get resolved they get discussed they get tabled they get let's form a committee let's get a discussion going and then uh nothing seems to happen and a lot of those involve officialdom where of course the main goal is just to get reelected. so why do controversial things or things that might upset some of our constituent base Let's just say we'll discuss it and we'll get to it uh, down the road. Down the road for some of these has been 20 years or more now. And if you're thinking, well, what's he talking about? Uh, there's a litany. You can go with, it took 40 years to get air into our classrooms. The stairway to heaven has still not been resolved. The uh, alternative uh, traffic routes to Leeward, Oahu has still not been figured out. The Waikiki <laughs> War Memorial Natatorium has still not been figured out. Some of these are 40, 50 year old problems. So, and that's all in the book. All in the book. Well, a couple of comments about the book. You know, what's interesting about the book is it, it, it does, it sort of forces you to, to keep it as a, um, a, a bedstand uh, read because uh, there's no table of contents, there's no index. The only organization is chronological. Uh, so, right. you know, you said, I think I'll, I think I'll read one of John's uh, pieces tonight. And you just go through the book, or or you pin the tail on on the op ed piece, and uh, you find it that way. And it's it's lush. Yeah, or, in, in or the, maybe the, there's or maybe there's one that stands out to you, or it affects your life. But I think what might be interesting to some people is if you read one, then go back up to the top and look at the date on it, and you'll see it was 2002, and you're going to go, wow, it's 2020, and nothing has changed on this thing. It's just the wheels the wheels move slowly if they move at all sometimes. Yeah, and, and I noticed that, you know, I mean, that would be a risk in a book, you know, which spans 20 years. Uh, some of those pieces uh, had become less relevant over time, uh, but not many. Uh, and, and, and what you see in the, in the book is uh, in bold at the bottom of a, a number of these pieces is your update comment. Your, you know, sort of. Yeah, um, I, I decided that some of them, I think, I think I figured out it's about 60% of them. I put a, a footnote or a smart aleck comment on the bottom, you know, something like, and still nothing has changed, or I updated a couple of them where it required it. But it, it really is important in reading the book, and each one of them are so short, it doesn't take you more than two minutes to read one. Uh, it's, it's, it's putting it into context of what was going on at the time. Uh, there's obviously a comment that I made right after 9-11. 
uh, you have to realize that was 19 years ago and realize the context of what people were going through, you know, some of which we're going through right now with uncertainty and everything, but that's appropriate for that specific place and time. And there are certain other economic things that came up and some of the uh, specifics I just mentioned. Take a look at the dates on some of the, you know, gosh, 12 years, nothing's changed or 12 years, we're right back where we were or wow, how much things have changed in the past seven years or nine years or whatever. So it really is a book that um, I, I think is mostly for local people. And it takes a score or a 20 year, two decade period of time. And as a friend of mine said, um, who, who read it, and he said, wow, lots of memories. And, and I think that's partially what this is, is it'll kind of take you along where we've come or where we haven't come over the last 20 years in a number of areas. Well, I wanted, I wanted you to uh, read a couple. Uh, we have time for that. Why don't you <clears throat> pick one and later on, we'll maybe we'll pick another. Um, but just to give us the flavor and, and uh, you know, the general context here. Okay, this one, uh, this one comes from September of 2015. And this one's probably appropriate for where we are right now in the world, but, uh, and you can do this today if you want. Um, I was driving over the coal, it's called Blue Sky Thinking. Um, I was driving over the Koala mountain range one glorious morning recently after yet another deluge had literally cleared the air of debris and fog. The sky was a gorgeous blue and the mountains looked like someone had just chiseled them with a sculptor's knife. Jagged peaks interspersed with brilliant shades of green and brown amid the silvery rock. So I did the appropriate and necessary thing and cranked up some music with my windows closed tight. First, my all-time favorite local song, Ku'u Homeo Kahalu by Olamana. And then I blasted The Meeting by Anderson, Bruford, Wakeman, and Howe, the core of the group. Yes, check it out. Uh, actually, anyway, I took the time to be in the moment of real joy and beauty, and I acknowledged how lucky I am on a number of fronts. I don't know when the last time was that you actually took the time to be present when you stand in our aqua waters slowly scan the horizon while looking out at the ocean or gaze up at the mountains. I don't know if you often or ever reflect on the good things you have going for you, but we surely have the spectacular outdoor opportunities for all of us to just once in a while say, you know, it's going to be all right. Attitude can make a big difference in how you deal with things. So maybe, just maybe, look up and around to find your bearings when things are going off kilter. It's okay to say, thank you, Hawaii Ne for being what you are and for allowing me to be here and witness your very essence. And thank you, eyes, ears, mouth, and nose, for giving me the sensory capability that I take for granted far too often. Sorry if this sounds a bit ethereal, corny, or schmaltzy, but I thought it might be of some value to think about it. Think about it, yeah. And, and, There's and, one. And, I mean, that, that is totally relevant in our time, totally relevant. Except you can't, you can't yeah. run around outside your house, that's all. <laughs> you know, when you're busy working and you've got a full life and you're going from activity or event to event and you've got kids and you've got financial obligations, it, it's hard sometimes to, to put a period on that. We always put commas and then move on to the next thing. Put a period on that, Jay, and look outside and go, wow, the mountains are beautiful. Or, wow, I can hear birds singing. I mean, it's so simple and yet... What and of course, my other ultimate act for anybody who's in the midst of tension and things is some music. It is scientifically proven that nothing affects you sure. better or quicker than music. And yeah, I'm including drugs and alcohol and a few other bad things for you. But uh, boy, find a song that makes you feel good or put on your favorite mixtape or whatever and, and just enjoy the moment and then go back to what you have to do. But it helps decompress. Best alive, all that kind of stuff. So this is uh, published by um, Watermark, uh, yeah. but it's on Amazon. Um, can I get it's it on Audible? Uh, it's not available as an audio book at this point in time. Uh, but but uh, if you get it from Watermark, not only will you get it quicker, but it helps a local company, obviously, and it's free shipping. So if you go to uh, hawaiibooks.net I think is is the one um, you can get it uh, within four or five days and of course Amazon in March was not shipping anything out except essentials so people were having to wait for stuff but now they're starting to get back to yeah. more normal um, sales so yeah you can get it from Amazon too 
So, you know, that, I mean, nobody is going to disagree with what you read. It's going to be inspirational. In fact, that's the tagline of the book, Ideas and Inspiration for Today's Hawaii. <clears throat> but some of the pieces you wrote were not nearly as generally acceptable. What I mean is uh, you took pot shots at people. Uh, I don't think you, you, know, you, you identified the individuals very often, although sometimes you did. <clears throat> and I wonder uh, if you can say that, A, you made friends with some of those pieces, and B, whether you had pushback from people because of some of the things you said in your more controversial pieces over the years, pushback from, from them, pushback from the community, pushback from the owners, pushback, any kind of pushback. Or did you have a, a full hand and nobody ever quarreled? Yeah, right. Ah. Um, I, uh, I, 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 would, I would call out people that I felt as a TV station for the community needed to be called out if things needed to be fixed. Uh, I wouldn't call out, you know, I wasn't trying to, the, the intent was never to bully or take advantage of people who couldn't help themselves in any situation. Um, but uh, yeah, I got feedback. I was once called into an elected official's office about what I'd written, and I was explained uh, what they were trying to do. And I said, it's been 20 years we've heard this, so stop saying it and start doing something. And they promised me, I won't say who and I won't say what, and they promised me something would get done. And that was two and a half years ago and nothing's been done since. So. Uh, I, I tried to point out that one of the things that the most important thing for a politician is to be reelected or else they're unemployed. So I understand that. But uh, oftentimes when legislative session is in play, we hear that they're going to discuss certain things and they do it, I think, so their constituents can say, well, at least they tried and everything like that. When in essence, they're not going to make any kind of potentially controversial changes. And I pointed out to this politician who is still in office, by the way, um, I said, look, nobody ever wins an argument with 10 people, 10 to nothing. You know that nobody ever wins 100% of the vote. So if you get 60% of the vote, you've got 40% who didn't like you. It should be the same way with some of these difficult decisions. If you're going to take a leadership position, you have to make what you think is the best decision and, and live with it. And this person said, hey, you don't need to tell me. I understand how politics work, but that's not how it tends to be. They, they, because we don't have a lot of competition in Hawaii, because we have a one-party system in Hawaii, it is much easier to not take major positions or things that could be con controversial or, or or upset people. So yeah, Jay, I had nasty emails. Uh, you know, who the f do you think you are? Uh, usually from anonymous people, and I would I would write back and tell those people, you know, thanks for your comments. Hopefully, you'll find something on here you enjoy. But we feel it's our part as a community uh, entity to uh, provide these forums and to say these things. And if you don't agree, uh, I'm sorry, um, hopefully you will. Most people in Hawaii are really nice. And if they would see me and recognize me in the stores or whatever, say, hey, you're the guy and that type of thing. And most of them, you know, my favorite one was when they'd say, this was so wonderful. They'd say, you know, I agree with you most of the time. And I said, well, that's great. So does my wife. I mean, I wouldn't expect you to agree with me all the time, but that's, that's very nice. To have a while. And I meant it. I'm glad they watched, you know. Uh, and, well, and, and occasionally, you know, you, occasionally, Jay, you'd find out from a person that you'd run into or an organization that, hey, you know, I read what you said and I did this or I'm going to do that or something. And, and that's great that hopefully people acted on it because it was really about you can take control. And I, I, people ask me, what's the underlying theme? And I know it says ideas and inspiration, but the underlying theme is you can make a difference. Everybody can make a difference. And it could be at home. It could be at work. It could be in their um, in their philanthropic work. It could be in church or whatever. I mean, you can make a difference, even if it's on a small level. I remember when I was coaching little kids with AYSO, you hope you make a little bit of a difference and, and the kid has fun and he remembers uh, that uh, soccer was fun and, and, you know, Coach John was my coach and we had a lot of fun. Okay, so you make a little difference there, but I think that's why we're all on this planet is to figure out how we can make a difference at some level. And that's the implication of think about it is do something about it. And then the frustration, of course, for the guy who writes this and, and reminds us that he wrote it before and nothing's changed is that, um, you know, nothing has changed. And so um, it, it's hard. It's hard to get action and it's hard to, uh, you know, keep being moderate and not angry when you don't see any changes. 
But, you know, one, one thing that strikes me is this is increasingly important for the media in general. Uh, you know, the old, in the old days, it was just give me the facts, give me pure journalism. I don't want to hear your opinion. Me, the media should be seen and not heard, uh, sort of thing. And um, it's things have changed. Things have changed. I mean, Rick Blangiardi does it on KGMB. Um, and uh, I, which one of you came first, by the way? Was it your pieces or his pieces? I don't. I don't really know. Uh, which I started in two thousand, and then Rick got into the company in uh, late two thousand nine. He began in two thousand ten or two thousand eleven. So I was on for a decade or so before Rick got involved. Um, um, and now he's done too, because obviously he's off TV and now he's going to run for mayor. But, you know, Jay, I, I would disagree with you on one thing. I would like to think that if I'm going to talk about pure media and information, that I'm getting factual information. I, I don't need a bunch of opinions. If I do, then, then make sure you tell me it's opinions. But if you're going to slant the news, if you're going to put things in a certain way that is obviously incredibly subjective or questionable where there aren't facts involved then call it that but don't call it news um and i want to say mm -hmm. i think i think some of the national media has done a really good job during this coronavirus i think the local media has done a great job and i think that when push comes to shove and when interviewed and asked people trust local media more than they trust any other source and i think they should continue to do so because as i've said on this show before jay when we're dealing with people in the news gathering business there is no such thing as fake news. It's a completely stupid term because locally, if you're doing fake news, here's what we say, you're fired. You're fired, okay? <laughs> if, you're making, if you're making mistakes covertly, if you're saying things incorrectly, if you know that it's not fact, but you're saying it because you have some other objective or some other position, you're fired. You can go do that elsewhere, but you can't do it where we're trying to put out news. So I would tell you that uh, somebody may get one warning, and then they're fired. So there is no such thing as fake news. Fake news in where I grew up is called a lie. And if it's a lie, you're fired. Yeah. <laughs> and, th and that takes us to the, you know, the whole thing. Now, the last piece in your book, um, the last one is January 2019. And you, you broadcast this on K5. Uh, you put it in your book. Um, and, and the point is, you were making these op-ed pieces uh, through at, at least a couple of years of the Trump administration. Um, did you cover that? Did you did you go after the Trump administration on questions of fake news and on questions of in inappropriate attacks and, and confusion to the public? Well, I, I guess I'm doing it now by telling you that anybody uses the term fake news uh, if it's not vetted, if it's not true, they should be fired. Uh, if it's if it doesn't meet with what you want it to be, that's a different story. So, no, I didn't really go after the Trump administration. You know, a, a broadcaster from Hawaii doing that, I don't know that that would have provided any value of note. I was really more interested in things as they related to Hawaii and let people form their own opinions on what they think should be right or wrong on a national front. But um, I, I really think that when it comes to all of our leaders. I mean, I really, uh, I'm really uh, a big believer in transparency, knowing that certain things have to be cloaked or are confidential for, for security reasons. I mean, I get all of that, but this idea that whenever somebody doesn't like what somebody's saying, again, if it is factual and it is not what you say you want it to be, that doesn't change the facts. You know, daddy always taught me, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And I think we need to remember that when we're talking about truths of what is going on. One of the problems with this coronavirus and things that should be done or might be done or suggested that should be done is we don't really have historical precedent in a lot of these areas. And some people think it's overkill. And that's a pardon the pun when I use the word kill. But my God, if we don't get some of these things right, many, many more people are going to die and and the cost of that some people would tell you well okay but we need to get back to work well death versus work those are those are two heavy things to to weigh against each other and i hear people doing that now and we got to be cautious on the side of humanity you know some of these same people who would tell me they were celebrating easter and then saying go back to work if a few people die that's the way it goes wow i'm not sure that works well with that bible thing so anyway 
Yeah. Well, we have a question, actually, John. Uh, I'll read it to you from, from a, a viewer. Question is, what commentary uh, of all these commentaries was most popular? Uh, and what commentary um, resulted in change? Is there one or a couple of them that, that come to mind when you look back down the field yeah, for um, 20 years of writing? You know, I normally would hit a topic and then not revisit it right away. I, it, I didn't want to beat a dead horse, so to speak. There was one that drove me crazy, and it was uh, one that, and I'm not going to say that this led to the change, but it certainly was part of the uh, the groundswell of support that came up. I met a, uh, a teacher uh, from Farrington High School who was eight and a half months pregnant, and it was uh, August or September, and she told me, um, I asked her when she was due, and I said, wow, it must be tough these days because it's hot. And she said she almost fainted in class the other day. And it, it raised my hackles up because this bit about our schools being overheated. So here's her story. She's in a classroom at Farrington. She says it is unbearably hot. So she keeps paper towels in the front of the room. And when the kids come in, they'll always grab paper towel. They will take black crepe paper or whatever you call it and put it up on the windows to help get rid of the sunlight. And there's one fan. So the kids who come in first, whereas a lot of kids like to sit in the back, they go to sit up front because they can get some air. And I'm sitting there going, what hypocrisy are we here? When we talk about test scores, we can't even have air for our children to breathe. So I did a couple of editorials and I started getting some support from the leeward side and from the windward side. And a guy who was the manager of um, Best Buy uh, right there uh, in town, he uh, emailed me and we got on the phone and he donated like 30 fans to Farrington uh, High School, which was great because that was something that was being done. We weren't just talking about it. And of course, I had letters and notes from parents saying the air stunk when I was a kid, which was 30, 40 years ago. We know it's been horrible on the leeward side. They've recorded temperatures of 97 degrees in classrooms on certain days and stuff. So the beauty of this was that at some point down the road, uh, 2014, maybe 2015, the governor announced that he was going to start implementing um, retrofitting. Uh, and of course, you had old electrical systems that had to be repaired. So they were doing some solar panels, but putting more fans in, putting more air into the classrooms. And in a lot of places, not all of them yet, but a lot of places, it's gotten better. And I believe the number was $100 million in retrofitting to give our kids breathable air. And wouldn't it make sense that you might do better on a test if you weren't worried about fainting? And if you could breathe and felt like you wanted to contribute, these are rooms, and I said it in the editorials, that you wouldn't put an animal in. You would, you would call the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And yet our kids are in those day after day, August, September, October, November, when it's beyond hot in some of these classrooms. So that was one that uh, did get some response. I did one about, um, everybody knows about the blood bank and the need for the blood bank to be continually... Um, gone to by people to, to provide blood in need. There's a place called the Blood Cord Bank where they take placentas from newborns and most people don't realize this and the placentas get disposed but all you got to do is tell your OBGYN you want to save the, the, the placenta and it gets frozen and it can be used to save lives. I thought that was incredible and um, I called them up so I got my information and I did the editorial on it and I called them a couple of weeks later because I was curious and they said, yes, they had had some phone calls from people interested. So you go, wow, wouldn't it be great if that people just found out about this and now a life has been saved or a life will be saved because you can store the placenta, for, you can freeze it and, and use it years later. So, I mean, things like that, Jay, were very rewarding. Um, and I've also had some, like I said, where I'd get a couple of emails or anonymous phone calls that were, who the hell do you think you are? Who cares what you have to say? And, you know, the answer to that is, well, uh, I hear you. You can change the channel. It's really not difficult. You, you know, in the old days, you had to get up and change the channel. Now you can well, just I, push I, a button. I think the media has a duty to do this. And uh, good for you that you did it all those years. Well, let's close the show with uh, one more of your op-ed pieces, if you don't mind. <clears throat> one of your favorites. <clears throat> and um, and see what you had to say on the one on this one. This one was uh, from the summer of 2016. It's called Empathy Starts Here. What's the biggest thing a kid needs to learn during the formative years? Well, talk to 10 psychologists, counselors, or sociologists, and you might get 10 different opinions. 
Recently, I read a short blurb from one educational psychologist who very strongly suggested that empathy is the most important trait for kids to learn to help ensure their relative happiness and success years later. Dr. Michelle Borba wrote a book called Unselfie, Why Empathetic Kids Succeed in Our All About Me World. The title alone suggests which road we seem to be going down with technology giving us easy access to instant information, a modicum of self-gratification, and an ease with which to say, look what I'm doing, because we all really need to know 24-7. Borba suggests that kids today, thanks in part to technological advances, are more self-absorbed than ever, with narcissism rates up 58% in college students versus 30 years ago. Anecdotal evidence suggests that cheating, bullying, and unhappiness levels are also up among our youth. One bad picture or statement online could peg you forever, in theory. That's a lot tougher than the old word of mouth network. So maybe teaching kindness, awareness of others' needs, and volunteerism will go a long way in your Kiki's development. Maybe celebrating helping others more than rigid practice schedules will reap the long des long-term desired effects. As Borba says, when was the last time you saw a bumper sticker that said, proud parent of a kind kid? And isn't that what Aloha Spirit is all about? Making a difference, being kind, humble, and aware. Now to promote these seemingly simplest, simple values, the adults must put down their addictive devices too, of course. Think about it. So um, I wrote that four years ago. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think it's ever been more true than today. We need more empathy. We need more people listening. We need to find more common ground because obviously there's too much of a rift that has been evolved and that's been going on for many, many years. I remember just to complete that thought, yeah, I got to sit next to Daniel Inouye and I, I don't care what you think about him, but Daniel Inouye was a longtime uh, helper of Hawaii and quite a, quite a wonderful man in my mind. And I said to him, what do you see in Washington, D.C.? And I understand this was probably 2010 or 11. And he said, John, I've never seen it so divisive. I've never seen it where people can't even talk across the aisles. And the anonymity and the venomous uh, repartee that goes on, because people can write nasty emails and things. You can only imagine what he must have been getting. Um, and he just said it was horrible. And that was, that was 10 years ago. So yeah. I just think we just need to calm down, settle down, find common ground. Maybe this is, uh, you know, if you believe in the spiritual, maybe what we're going through right now is the wake up call for all of us that we do need to help each other out more often and figure out ways to come together as opposed to splitting apart. Yes, we're remaking ourselves right now as we speak. That's John Fink. His book is Think About It. It's on Amazon and uh, it's on, um, what is it? Watermark. What's the name of it? Watermark Press what? right here in Hawaii. And it's, uh, it's right. got um, 180, 90 uh, of his op-ed pieces. And there's, uh, my, my mathematics indicates that there's um, another 1,800 of them on the cutting room floor. So there's probably gonna be a second edition come along here soon. And if you wanna some see some of his recordings, they're actually on YouTube. I went, looked, and we haven't even started talking about all his stuff on sports. Because not only is John a Renaissance man, um, but he is also a, a, a sports fanatic. And he understands sports pretty much the way he understands media. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for joining us. It's been great talking to Always you. Always a pleasure, Jay. Look forward to the next time. Aloha.